Ireland in England, rugby league never left its cradle. It still lies landlocked in three northern counties. The coal and heavy woolen area of Yorkshire, the mill towns of Lancashire and the dockland of Cumberland. Whoa, I think we should move on from these outdated stereotypes about the North and rugby league. Looking at you, the person who brought a ferret into a Castleford game. Anyway, rugby league is no longer the exclusive pastime for pit monkeys from Wigan. It's played all over the world, in exotic locations like France, Canada, the Pacific, and even London. But where did it all start? Well, to find that out, I'm going to the one place where it was born, Huddersfield. Let's start by going back to the history of rugby. Now, we've all heard the famous story of how rugby was invented when William Webb Ellis, a schoolboy at rugby school, picked up the ball during a football match and ran with it, thus inventing the sport. However, this was probably complete rubbish. Games like this had been played in the British Isles for hundreds of years, and different public schools all had their different and competing versions of the game. Rather, the first codified rules of the sport were written down at rugby school in 1845. The reason why the story of William Webb Ellis probably became popular was because it legitimised the rugby school rules as the proper and official ones. You see, all the different public schools had different versions of the game and they were all trying to make their version the proper one. So by having a convenient creation myth which invented the sport, the rugby school could now lay claim to having their rules as being the official, authentic and original ones. Ex-pupils of rugby school later went on to found rugby clubs where they could continue to play the sport. The first schism came with the creation of the Football Association in 1863. The clubs who formed it preferred a game focused on kicking and dribbling rather than running and handling. In response, the Rugby Football Union was formed in 1871. It's important to note that all the founding member clubs were from either London or the home counties and had played the sport at public school. The sport soon spread to the north where it became hugely popular. In fact, it was so popular that Yorkshire had more rugby clubs than anywhere else in the country. There was a huge influx of working class players from Yorkshire, Lancashire and Cumbria. The Yorkshire County Club, later the Yorkshire RFU, was founded in 1869 by the oldest clubs in Yorkshire, Bradford, Leeds, Huddersfield, Hull and York. In 1877, the Yorkshire Cup was created, the first competitive knockout style cup in the UK. Although the concept of competing for a prize was hugely popular with the players and spectators of Yorkshire, it really riled up the RFU because it railed against their core value, amateurism. Amateurism was a classic Victorian public school value. It was a belief that sports should be played for pleasure, not profit, and that any money given to players would turn them into greedy, dishonest players who only cared about winning. As such, any payments from clubs to players were banned. Yorkshire was the first to implement amateurism rules in 1879. The RFU would follow in 1886. This was difficult for the working class players who had to cover all their expenses themselves and often had to take time off work to train or play. As a result, some clubs began to offer broken time payments, which were wages given to players to compensate for the time off work. However, this was considered professionalism by the RFU and strictly banned. It's important to note, however, that the RFU often took a blind eye to payments. It just depended who was being paid. Teddy Bartram, a Wakefield Trinity player, had been receiving payments since 1879, but he was banned for life by the RFU. This is despite the fact that the 1888 England team all were paid as well, yet none of them were punished. One critic in 1909 complained, the RFU turn out bag and baggage all players who wish to be recompensed for loss of working time and consequent loss of wages, and the next day are willing to allow sums of 12 shillings or 21 shillings a week for what are euphoniously described as personal and petty expenses. What is professionalism in a working man is evidently something very different in a player of slightly superior social status. Support for these broken time payments continued to grow throughout the 1890s and in 1893 a number of northern clubs complained that they were vastly underrepresented in the leadership of the RFU. This meant that all their proposals would get voted down and when they proposed that broken time payments be legalised, this was refused. Shortly after, many clubs were suspended for professionalism. It was only a matter of time before they'd start to break away. It's here at the George Hotel in Huddersfield that in 1895, 22 clubs decided to break away from the Rugby Football Union and from the Northern Union. Rugby League was born. 
the RFU came down hard on this and banned any RFU clubs from playing against the Northern Union. In addition, any player who had played for Northern Union teams were now banned from playing in the RFU for life. However, I want to make one thing clear. This wasn't a geographical issue. It wasn't North versus South. It was about class. Frank Marshall, who was headmaster of Almondbury Grammar School in Huddersfield, was one of the fiercest inquisitors against players who had received payments. He even suspended his own club, Huddersfield. And this is what he had to say. The working man player has not taught us anything in the way of style or skill in playing the game. Physique and stamina are above the average, he undoubtedly has. But to say that he knows more about the game than when he was being brought up in the best traditions of the public schools and the universities is absurd. If the case against the IRFU couldn't get any more damning, this is an extract from an official letter sent by them in 1906. The game of rugby football has always been at its best when good players were available from our public schools, and the more public school men get to play our game, the better we are certain it is for it. Before the split, clubs in Yorkshire, not including schools and universities, formed 35% of the total number of clubs in the RFU. After the split, there were just 3%. So that's how the Northern Union was formed. But how did the sport actually evolve into the one we recognise today? Well, the process began a long time ago. As early as 1892, the suggestion was made to reduce the number of players from 15 to 13. This was not, however, considered as a rule until 1906. The line-out was removed in 1897, and in 1906, the play-the-ball rule was introduced. Previously, a scrum had to be formed every time a player with the ball had been tackled. This significantly speeded up the pace of the game and made it more viewer-friendly, as often the ball was hidden from view during the scrum. Perhaps the most famous aspect of rugby league, the limited tackle rule, was introduced in 1966, with each team allowed only four tackles. This came about as a result of a match between Huddersfield and Hulkingston Rovers, during which Huddersfield only touched the ball twice during the entire first half. So that's been a very brief history of Rugby League. I hope it's been somewhat informative for you and hope to see you again soon.